Well, hello everybody, it's uh, Philip Shields, and I'm here with part two of the sermon we started last time about why was 2020 so wild. In the next sermon after this, I want to get into the shakings, and specifically the shakings, uh, a very clear view from Jeremiah 18 and other chapters. What God says uh, can make him really hit us hard, and, and, and really hard with the uh, shakings, or that can cause him to give up on that. So anyway, um, today I want to talk about what we, the children of God, have to do and what he expects us to be doing in hard times and rough times and scary times, what activity he wants us to be doing. Um, and also I want to remind us that uh, we've taken some critical missteps, I think, some of us, in the weeks and months ago uh, in a, in, as we dealt with the terrible things of 2020 and what's starting to happen in 2021. Certainly 2021 has not started much better. So... Last time I talked also about the very name of the year that was chosen by God, 2020, is a commonly accepted phrase. And I think it has merit to say that we all, when we think of 2020, we think of someone has 2020 vision, it sees well. And I think God is trying to tell us, hey, you guys, do you see? Do you see what I'm doing to the whole world? It's been rough, not just in America, but all around the world. I tried to make it very clear in the, in the sermon, that uh, hurricanes were all over the world. Uh, it was a record year. Wildfires were all over the world. Locust plagues, earthquakes, typhoons, uh, riots, protests. All of this was all over the world. Uh, election uh, contests that were disputed all over the world. Uganda, the Philippines, Malawi, Ghana, Belarus, uh, Israel's coming up. I'm sure they'll be contesting some things there. I'm sorry for the noise there. But anyway, so... Before we get started, I want to, let's just open in, 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 in prayer to God first for a couple of minutes. And so let's, uh, let's do that, just bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, you are Jehovah, you are Abba, our daddy, you are God most high. And boy, we love to come to you in these difficult times. And we want to acknowledge your presence. We want to ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit on those listening today those watching, and on me, the speaker, that we will say things that reflect your spirit, your attitude, your insight, and may those hearing these words, Father, uh, hear the things you want them to hear, even beyond the words I'm saying. Dear Father, Father in heaven, dear Father, we just want to please you. We just pray, pray that our actions and our lives are actions and lives that, that bring joy to you, that please your heart. We want to please you and please your heart. So that's what we seek now for the rest of our lives. And we just ask you to help us to grow in that, to become one with you and one with one another, and to just evict and, and, and emote the, the love that you have for people. So now we just raise our hands and we raise your people up to you for your guidance and your, 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 your blessing in Jesus' name. Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, let's continue on here. Um, in Romans 8, verses 22 and 23, Paul even says, even back in his day, certainly even more so today, but back in his day, there was a lot going on. And he said, you know what? It's the whole creation groans. The trees, the grass, the wildlife, the plant life, animals, as well as people. The whole creation groans. For what? Like in childbirth, he says, not only it, but we ourselves who have got the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly. This is Romans 8, verses 22 and 23. We groan inwardly as we continue waiting eagerly to be made sons, to be made children of God. And that is to have our whole bodies redeemed and set free, changed to spirit bodies in the resurrection. He's saying we can't wait for that to happen. We're all groaning for it. So much is happening. And yet, I'll tell you, so much is happening also that we don't see. We don't see what's being said and done in the Vatican or among generals or between FBI and, and CIA and MI6. We don't see what's happening. In, in the real news, we get the news they want us to hear. But, you know, we don't see what's happening. Beyond that, the, the real activity going on in the spirit world above us is what's really, really important. We don't see that. We, but I hope we're beginning to sense it. 
And I hope you realize there was a very foul spirit that went through the whole land, the whole world last year and seems to be continuing this year. There's a battle going on between the armies of God and the armies of Satan. And he who is with us is stronger than he who is in, in the world. God has never lost a battle. He's never lost any portion of a battle, ever. So be encouraged by that. No matter what you see, no matter what happens to our flesh, that's nothing in terms of the eternal glories that will be revealed in us. Nothing. So anyway, greetings again. I'm Philip Shields. I'm the host and founder of Light on the Rock and uh, hoping that you uh, keep coming. If you like the messages, if they're helping you, let other people know about it. And I'd like to right now just remind you that on the home site, on the home page, we have video sermons. And then you scroll down a bit, you can see there are audio sermons. Scroll down some more, there are blogs. Also, at the very top of the home page, uh, you can click on those words, of videos, audios, blogs. And as you click on them, everything that we've ever done is all up there. And so use the search bar. Type in a word or two, not a lot, just a word or two. If you want to know more about the Pharisees, you want to know about the Sabbath, or you want to know about love, or whatever it is, marriage, thankfulness, thanksgiving, type the, the, uh, write those words in, and uh, sermons and blogs will pop up. So we talked about a lot of topics, hundreds and hundreds of them. So anyway, from this point on, um, let's try to keep moving. The shaking from God, again, I'm going to say what's worldwide. God is shaking the whole world. Why? Because he loves everyone. And in uh, Hebrews 12, verses 26 to 28, he tells us why he's shaking us. He tells us why he's shaking us. Even Hebrews 12, 26, 28, in the uh, complete Jewish Bible, even then his voice shook the earth back when he came to Mount Sinai. I think it's the context. But now he's made this promise. One more time, I will shake not only the earth, but the heaven also. And this phrase, one more time, makes clear that the things shaken are removed. There are things in our lives God wants to get out. And the things that make us seek God with all our heart are times when it's rough. When times are going well, we tend to be fat and lazy and content. And we start feeling like God's really blessing us. The need and the urgency to pray, to pray it just isn't there. As when you hear your wife is dying or your son's been hit by a car or, or your, your father has cancer or you've lost your job or somebody has COVID and is in ICU on a ventilator. Those are times that make us pray. And it shakes out the, the fluff that's in our lives. So the things that remain are the things that can't be shaken, as he goes on to say here. Let's put that back up here. One more time makes clear the things shaken are to be removed so that the things that can't be shaken remain. God wants to know that we appreciate what are, what are true values, what are truly important, our true friends, the God himself and Yeshua and the Holy Spirit, character that we're building, experiences we're building, growing in the love. Those are things that can't be shaken. And that's what God wants us to do. So what should we do next? I'm going to go through several points of things that I feel God's people really need to focus on now. Number one. I've given sermons now recently about prayer, for example. Uh, one of my recent sermons was when you aren't motivated to pray, what should you do? Well, number one point here today is make seeking after God your number one priority. Make sure every day in the morning, at night, and during the middle of the day, and spontaneously all during the day, that you are coming before the highest and before Yeshua. Make sure that if you're coming before him in formal prayer, I like to take a minute or two to just get myself in sync with the right attitude I should be. The Bible says prepare your steps before you come before God. Prepare your mind. Prepare your attitude. Know who you're coming before. Now, compared to when I pray spontaneously, that's, that's different. I could be in the middle of something and just spontaneously just start talking to God. But even then, I try to remember who it is I'm addressing. But make part of the seeking after God be a return to God. Look at your life. Get rid of the fluff, the stuff, the sins, the lukewarmness that you've allowed in your life. The spiritual 
sins, the unspiritual sins in your life, the gossiping, the lusting, the coveting, the sexual sins of the heart and mind, taking God's name in vain, being careless with the Sabbath, not honoring people, not honoring our father and mother, and maybe lying all too often. It's, it's amazing to me how easily people lie. So number one, seek God with all your heart. Turn to him, repent, change from the things you know are not pleasing to him. So there's a verse in 1 John that says, I think it's 1 John 3, 24. It's not in my notes. I hope that's it. That says that um, something like when we pray, we have confidence that he will hear us because we do the things that are pleasing to him, because we keep his commandments. 1 John, I think it's 3, 24. Number two, uh, let me write that down so we put it in the notes. And I'll double check that that is the right verse. Number two, obey all your king's commands. Yeshua is our king. As our king, he doesn't give us suggestions. As our king, he's very direct, sometimes rough, frankly. I mean, when he says, I never knew you, depart from me. I mean, that's pretty tough. And so one of his commands is that we have to love everybody, even our enemies. Yeah, even those guys over there, even that other party, or even people we think are criminals, or sometimes it's just people that you, you, you just kind of don't want to be around. Uh, they, they dress funny compared to you, or you don't like their ta tattoos. The Bible, by the way, says don't be marking up your body. If you have, you can't do much about it now. But if you're thinking about having a tattoo, I have a blog. By the way, just type in tattoo. I have a blog on it. I'm seeing tattoos everywhere, but I don't know why women especially want to look like they have bruises all over their legs. <laughs> I just, at a distance, that's what it looks like to me. But anyway, God says, don't do it. And so, and you might say, well, that guy's all tattooed up. I don't like, he looks kind of shabby or I don't know. I, I just don't like him. God says, love him anyway. Love her anyway. Matthew 5, 43 to 46, that maybe they're of that other party that you so dislike. Love them anyway. Love them. Love them. Let's read what he says in Matthew 5, 43 to 46. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Some of us have a hard time loving our wife or our husband. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. You don't give them the finger. You don't uh, say bad things back to them. You don't use profanity and F words at them. No. Do good to those who hate you. Are you kidding me? How many of us really apply that? Write this out on a three by five card and put it in front of you. Move it around so you see it. So it doesn't just get lost. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And the prayer is not, I Father, I hope they die. The prayer is to, Father, please bless them. Help them in their marriage. Help them in their finances. Help them with a, he's looking for a job or something. Bless them. That, verse 45, that you may be sons, children of your Father in heaven. You're not even considered by Yeshua a child of God if we can't love our enemies because we're supposed to be like our Father. He makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, I don't know about you, but if I didn't like this, this one, if I'm God, and I'm the way I can be carnally, <laughs> and I'm up there in heaven, and I don't like the way these people over here are treating my children. Okay, I'm going to send nice rain when it's due to my children, and I'm going to send real heavy hail over here on the other side. But I hope we're not going to do that. You see what he's saying? God sends the sun on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's amazing. That's amazing. I should get my, <laughs> get my voice down. For if you love those who love you, so what? Everyone does that? Okay, that's me saying that way. But I mean, it's no big deal. But if you love your enemies... And bless those who curse you. That's, that's really doing something. Now, these are not suggestions. These are commands to us. You might hate Trump. Love him. 
You might hate Biden and Kamala Harris. Love them. You may hate Duterte over in the Philippines, the president, or Lukashenko over in Belarus, or other leaders that you have just been elected to a landslide, supposedly in Uganda, or Ghana, or Malawi, all of these other places. Love them. Pray for them. You Americans, Schumer, Biden, Kamala Harris, Mike Pence, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, you know, all the all the different uh, Republicans, if you don't like them, love them. You getting it? John even goes on to say in his gospel that it, you can prove that you love these people by doing kind things, uh, taking care of people. The second great command, remember, was this guy had come to Jesus and, and said, well, what are the two greatest commandments? And he said, love God with all everything you've got, your heart, your mind, your soul, energy, everything, all your power. And the second one is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the guy said, yeah, that's cool, but who's my neighbor? I know if I want to love everybody. And so Yeshua gives a story about this traveler, this man who was attacked by hoodlums and robbers and left for dead practically. And then the priest and the Pharisee and others walked, or whoever they were, but they were people of the cloth, so to speak, saw that, but they had things to do at the temple. They had to hurry. And so they kept going and did nothing. But a Samaritan, a despised group of people from the Jewish point of, point of view, they despise Samaritans. He comes along and he takes care of the guy, pays the bill of his care, puts him in a, what we call a motel or, or an inn, takes care of him and takes care of his wounds. Which one was the, the neighbor? The guy had to admit, well, I guess the Samaritan. Ew, do I have to say that word, Samaritan? So the people that you don't like are also neighbors. Pelosi or McCarthy or Schumer or McConnell. Maybe you don't like any of them. God says to love them. Love them. Neighbor means everyone. Something I want us to start growing in, myself, I speak to myself very much. Don't get so tied into politics and other things that you start dividing up your families, splitting families and friends apart. People uh, disown you, or what do they call it? They bar you from Facebook. You know, it's no point to that. Okay, so are we going to be obedient to that first one, to love everyone? Now, how about this one, 1 Peter 2.17? Are you going to be obedient to this one? Honor all. Your Bible might say all people. The word people is not there. Honor all. Love the brother, brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. The king at that time was Nero. Let those words sink in. If Biden becomes president, like it looks like he will be, Tomorrow, I'm recording this on the 19th, if he does become president, honor him, love him, even pray for him, as we're told in 1 Timothy. If Trump is president, or Obama is president, or Duterte, or Lukashenko, or whoever it is over in your country, pray for them, love them, love them and honor the man or the woman who's leading in that office. And it doesn't just say honor their office. It means honor the king. It doesn't just say the king's office. Some people try to wiggle around that and say, well, I know i got to honor the, the office. That's not what it says. And as you speak about anyone, Colossians 4, verse 6, and these are rules, commands, that Yeshua says, I want you to start keeping these from now on. Colossians 4, verse 6, let your speech always be gracious, always be with grace. Seasoned with salt. What does salt do? It makes food tasty, tasteful. So our talk needs to be tasteful. I haven't always had tasteful talk or gracious talk. Everyone knows that. I mean, I, I hope I've grown a lot in that over the years. But over the years back, yeah, there were times I could, I could really let out some anger and some unkind words. Don't be like that. I don't want to be like that. I want to be like this. Seasoned with salt, with grace. And Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no bad language, no harmful language come out of your mouth. Only good words that are helpful to edify, to build up, okay, to meet the need. Words that will benefit those who hear them. 
as the, King, as, as the complete Jewish Bible puts it. Uh, the way we talk about people and to people. No more name calling. No more name calling on Facebook. Not if you're a Christian. Remember what Yeshua said. Love them so that you may be seen as a true child of God. If you're calling people you don't like terrible names on Facebook, shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on me if and when I do that. That is not of God. That has to stop. Or else Yeshua says you're not even considered a child of God yet. Because that's what they do, Father and Christ. They are, now they're God. They can, they can say what they want to and about anybody. But at the same time, the example after the Son of God was beaten and hit and, and, and in excruciating ten, uh, in pain, I mean, what, what, what did he do? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Now, when you love somebody, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean you have to approve of everything they do. If you're in a meeting and five or ten of you are in a meeting and someone says, oh, man, I'm so glad we're going to have more liberal abortion laws. We need we need more abortion or something to that effect. I'm not going to sit there and be quiet. I'm not going to call him names. I'm not going to call him a baby killer. I have in the past. Going forward, name calling doesn't do anything. So I, but I think we all should, in cases like that, say, I don't agree. And here's why I don't agree. You're entitled to your opinion. My opinion is that's so wrong. And here's why. And the people who are there kind of not knowing whether they're for or against abortion or should be for or against it, sometimes it just takes somebody like you speaking up to uh, make the point. So we can disapprove of what's being done and conduct and all that. We can disapprove of that. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. Some of you have new leaders in your countries. You may like them or not. Remember the one I gave you, honor the king. Beyond honor the king, it also says here, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, Therefore I exert, first of all, that supplications, prayers, and intercessions be made, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for all men, for all those in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Do you pray for your president? What if the other guy got in or the woman got in? Would you pray for her? Would you pray for Hillary as much as you would pray for Trump? Did you pray for Obama? I did. I did. Because I know that verse that says you've got to pray for people in authority. You have to honor the king. You have to honor everybody. You have to love your enemies. So I think going forward in the rough times coming, God is trying to say to all of us, hey, you guys, our family is different from the rest. We love those who hate us. We're nice to those who are mean to us. We honor everybody. We honor especially those in authority and pray for them. So I hope we can get there and move along in that kind of consideration. No matter how they treat us or imprison us or beat us up, we love them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Just like my king said, may that be our prayer in times like that. So that's number two. Obey his commands to love and honor. Point number three, let's stop being afraid. Be calm. Don't let your hearts be troubled in times of uncertainties. I love this point here in uh, John 14, verses 1 and 27. The Son of God, who knew what crucifixions were, he'd seen them on the roadside as he walked from town to town. He'd see a man being crucified, and he'd hear the horrible screams of being scourged. He knew that would be him someday. And within hours of all that starting for him, his words to his disciples in John 14, 1 is, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. Verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not the like the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. So you've just been told you're, you're COVID positive, you're, you're COVID positive. 19 positive. Don't let your heart be troubled. If we die, we die. But most likely we're not. 
especially if you're younger than 65 or 70 in pretty good health. You might feel weak and tired for a week or something, and most people get over it, 99.5% certainly don't die. Now, those who are dying are mostly the older people or those with comorbids who have other health factors as well. Don't let yourself be afraid. Now, everyone gets afraid sooner or later. David, who courageously faced the, the giant Goliath, said he, sometimes he gets afraid. And he said in Psalm 56, verse 3 and 11, Psalm 56, verse 3, Whenever I am afraid, so even David got afraid at times, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust you. That's how we get past the fear, is that we see past the giant into our giant, who is a giant God behind everything that, we're ha that we have to get done. The Lion of Judah is our giant. He is our giant. Verse 11, In God I put my trust, I won't be afraid. What can man do to me? I trust God. So why, why be afraid of what COVID-19, losing my job, being thrown off Facebook, uh, or the wrong president, in my opinion, gets put in? Remember that God says he puts the leaders in. Romans 13, verse 1. All authority, all administration, all, all kings and authorities are put there by God himself. Romans 13, verse 1. Maybe I should write that down so that I make sure you all read that verse there. Romans 13, verse 1. We sometimes don't like God's choice. Let's be honest. Sometimes we don't like God's choice. Well, I hope we grow up. I hope we grow up and learn that he's the one in charge. Isaiah 41, 13 is a, one of my favorites to read. Actually, verses 10 to 13. I'll just look at 13. But starting in verse 10 to 13 is awesome. I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. I'll help you. In Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, and Isaiah 26, verses 2 to 4. Those are very, very human uh, times that we, and ways that we sometimes do fear. Um, I had a man in his 20s who uh, was very fearful of COVID, and he would write me, afraid he, his mom might get it, afraid that his work associates would, would get it, that he might get it. I think he was only in his 20s. And sometimes he would cry, he said. If you're hearing this, by the way, I hope you... Don't mind me using your example for others. I mean it positively. And I did give him these very same verses I just gave you. I gave them to him. I said, study these verses on your knees. Say them over and over again. And we talked some more in other, other emails. And one email I was fairly strong. I said, you got you to get a grip. You got to get a grip. You cannot let your heart be troubled, Yeshua said. And so I got an email recently from him saying, my mom does have COVID. And uh, but you know what? I trust God. He knows he knows what's happening and he has all power to do what he wants to do. And I trust him. I thought, what a beautiful letter to get. So don't be afraid. It's going to get tougher and tougher. Meteorites start hitting in the towns around us. Pandemics start overflowing all over the world. Persecution against Christians starts coming. We're being rounded up, put in jail here and there. That's happening, by the way, already all around the world. Don't let your heart be troubled. 2 Timothy 1.7 God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And so um, God doesn't like fearfulness. Gideon's army, he told Gideon, hey, anybody who's afraid, let him go home. I don't need him. So let's not be afraid. We all can start afraid. I, I have been afraid many times. But See our powerful Father, so we aren't afraid. We're being prepared for our role of Sunday bringing peace to others and how we can have an anchor in Christ and show them how we got that anchor. And one way is to be calm and just say, thank you, God, for this and in this situation I'm in right now, knowing that uh, you know all about it. Look at Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. Don't ever fret. Be anxious for nothing in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which you can't understand, surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. What do we just read? In everything, 
let God know about it. Hey, Father in heaven, there's a hurricane bearing down right on our town in about seven more hours. I'm going to thank you in this hurricane, for this hurricane. I'm going to thank you that I have you there as well. I'm not going to fear. I thank you and I praise you in it. Something happens when you thank God for even the bad things. Something happens. It's called peace. You're reminded as you thank God that he knows every hair on your head. He knows every thought you have. He knows everything that's going to happen, could happen. He knows everything going on around you. He does let us get tested for our strength, to be strengthened and tried. Yes, he does. But he's with you and he'll help us. He won't let us go through any difficulty beyond our ability to cope, we're told. That's how we get peace, is by being thankful even in the pain and in the storm, in everything, for everything. I've had to do that many times when my son died. I had to do that. I had to get on my knees beside the bed and say, this is very hard. I preached it. I'm supposed to thank you somehow that my son's died in it, for it. Ephesians 5.20, for all things. Philippians 4, verse 6, in all things, in everything. I remember saying, Father, do you even know what that feels like? I'm in so much pain right now. And then I felt like an idiot. Of course he knew how I felt because it came to me. It was almost like God was saying it in my mind. I, it was just, it just hey, he, I lost my son, my only son. You've got two daughters still. You can have other children. I lost my only son viciously. Of course I know how it feels. And I'm with you. And I'll strengthen you. So then it went from how horrible this is, to thanking him that he was there, just praising him. Other times I've fretted and stewed and worried and feared. So, I mean, I've had both sides. I've done all of it. The peace is a lot better. I trust, trust me on that. I think so often we get into, Father, where are you? Where are you? How come you're not doing anything? Even on these elections, there's so many conservatives who are saying, aren't you going to do anything, Father? This was all so bad. Well, the other side feels it wasn't bad. The other side feels it was all fair. God knows what happened. God can fix it. But we don't look to, that's another point coming up, but don't keep looking to Trump as the answer. He's not the answer. God is the answer. But too many of you are putting your faith in Trump that he's got to be president or else we all go to hell in a handbasket, as the saying goes. That might even be true or it might not be true. But what's really true is that we need to look to God and have get rid of the fear that now everything's going to go terrible. So no fear. Point number two was to love him. With, uh, I mean, to love, to love uh, our enemies and pray for those and, and honor everyone. Point number three. Point number three is to not have this fear, but to have a peace of God that surpasses understanding when we go to him and uh, ask him to give us uh, the knowledge that he's there with us. Point number four, please, every, all of you, I've kind of said this already. I, I, some of you, were, uh, this is January 19 when I'm giving this. January 20, Biden's supposed to be inaugurated. It's not done yet, and many of you are passing rumors around that Trump's going to still be president, and here's how it's going to happen. Here's what Biden's going to, what's going to happen to Biden. What's wrong with that? Even if you're right, and even if that happens, I don't think it's going to that happen that way, but even if it happens, isn't that looking to Trump, to man, too much? I think it is. Don't do that. Instead, keep looking to what God is doing. God doesn't need Biden or Trump. They're both flawed human beings. He doesn't need either one. I think God's trying to get us to have our fill of, of uh, human government, to want his government instead. And God says, you know, you're all worried and upset because you think an election was stolen in Uganda and the Philippines and Belarus and America, all these countries in Malawi. And when King Uzziah of Judah died, King Uzziah what had been a mostly righteous king, he had his issues, mostly righteous king, 
And he had made Judah prosperous. He'd made America great again, <laughs> if I can put it that way, especially the first three years. Um, people liked that. They were wealthy. They were powerful. Now he's dead. And who's going to be the next king? Oh, it's going to be terrible. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, what God did was Isaiah 6, verses 1, two, one and 2. Verse, uh, yeah, Isaiah 6, verse 1 and 2 is what I'm going to read. In that year that King Uzziah died, I saw Jehovah sitting on his throne, on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. He talks about these seraphim with six wings that were above the throne. God's answer to Isaiah when he's fretting, what are, what are we going to do? We don't have a good king anymore. What do you mean you don't have a good king anymore? I'm the king overall. I'm still on my throne. I can handle this. Don't fret if even an evil king comes in. I can handle that. God saying, reminds me, you know, he's our father. Our father is, happens to be the God most high. One time my children, when they were little, we were all driving late at night, coming home, and it was raining hard, dark. This was before GPS. My oldest daughter was probably about seven or eight, and then I had a six-year-old daughter as well. And in all that rain, I probably made a couple of bad turns, and I remember feeling lost. My wife's there beside me, the kid's in the back seat. And I just muttered, I didn't know they'd hear it, but I just muttered, oh dear, where are we? And um, pre-GPS days, one of my daughters heard that and blurted out, Dad, are we in trouble? Are we lost? Oh no, what are we going to do? <laughs> my wonderful wife looks behind and back at them calmly, says calmly, girls, relax. Dad's got this. We'll be all right. Soon after that, they were asleep. I still struggled finding my way home. <laughs> I'm not God, but the principle is our Father in Heaven's got this. No matter what this is, He's got this. Relax. In the mess, so much of the world is in after hurricanes. Honduras is suffering. Philippines. Lockdowns. Now the latest report is lockdowns don't even do any good anyway. Social distancing, washing, um, keeping clean, keeping your distance, all of that, that apparently does hurt, help, but not lockdown so much. But anyway, so if you're locked down, you're, lo you're, you're losing your job, your boss has to close the shop, the, the business, he's going to lose his business. God is still on his throne. Go back and read sometime Nehemiah 1 and Daniel 9. I don't have time to take the time today to read it. But when Nehemiah heard what was happening in his country, he was so upset. He fasted, he wept, he cried, and he sought God, and he acknowledged his sin. Point number one, seek God as never before returned to him. That's what Nehemiah did. Daniel, as the 70 years captivity was coming to an end, he reminded God of that. And he says, we, I, we have done wickedly before you. It's not anything we're proud of. Please hear my prayer. And you can mourn for the country, your country, all around the world. We mourn, some of us here in America. Others are rejoicing. But have you ever wept over the walls, broken down over our country? God has removed the hedges of protection around America. To me, that's really clear. It was clear to my mom 60 years ago when I was 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, 12 years old. I remember at different times I could hear my mom praying and sobbing in her bedroom. And one time I just said, Mom, why do you sob so much when you cry? And she says, I'm crying not just because I'm repenting of my own faults. I couldn't see my mom had faults, but she said she had faults, sins. But for the nation, and so much is going to happen to this nation because we have left our God. It makes me weep. So that's what happened here in Nehemiah, chapter 1. 
And I hope our fasting and praying brings results in our life, brings absolute results. Let me just see something here. But we've got to quit relying on man. We've got to quit relying on Trump and what Trump might do. It's like, it's like you're all saying that God needs Trump. Now, if God puts Trump back in, so be it. But God doesn't need Trump to do what he wants to, to get done. He doesn't need that to happen. Okay, number four. Let's move on to number four. Remember, God's timing is often way too late to satisfy us. Uh, God often waits till it's too late. So in the years ahead, and, and, and you get a, a, a terrible disease, or you're told you had cancer, or God hasn't healed your husband who was in a car accident, or whatever the situation is, or someone's elected you don't like, and you think it's going to be a disaster for you and everybody else in the country, whatever the decision is, remember that God's timing is often very different from ours. We just have to trust him. But he's very good at even when it all seems lost, He's very good at when it seems too late for anything to happen now, for even God to do anything, because it's already all done. God's a master if he wants to turn things around to do it. Think of the story of Lazarus and Johnny Lazarus down in John 11. Yeshua was told, hey, your friend Lazarus, and Yeshua was some, some ways away, at this point, is sick and they're hoping you'll come and heal him. Yeshua waited two more days before he even started the journey down, to, was it Bethany where they lived in, I think? By the time he got there, Lazarus had died and had been dead four days now and was in the tomb. Martha pretty much says, I'm glad you came, but he's dead. It's too late. And Yeshua made it a, a time of testimony and said, if you believe, do you believe that, you, that there will be a resurrection, that you can see your brother again? He says, yes, in the resurrection. He says, if you believe in me, that I'm the life and, and the resurrection, you will see your brother again. Not just in the resurrection, but I mean right now. And she said she believed. And it was a moment of testimony. But the man was dead. And, but it wasn't too late for God. Nor was it too late for Israel when they faced the Red Sea on, in front of them and, and the armies behind them. And Moses was telling them, stand still. Exodus 14, verses 13 to 14. Okay, don't be afraid of all those Egyptians behind us with their chariots and their swords and arrows and spears and all that. Stand still. See the salvation. See the Yeshua of Jehovah. See the Yasha. That's where we get the name Yeshua. And see the salvation of Jehovah, which he will accomplish with you today. He won't see these Egyptians again, he says. Now, sermons have been preached on that verse, which he's telling them to stand still. And yet, in the very, very next verse, uh, Jehovah says to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell them to get moving. Tell the children of Israel to go forward. <laughs> I love that. Daniel in the lion's den. I'm sure he prayed about it when, when the edict came out that you can't pray to anybody except Nebuchadnezzar for the next 30 days. Talk about ego. But he was a type of the end time false prophet and beast power and all that who's going to declare that he is, he is God. So Nebuchadnezzar did that. I'm God for 30 days. If you pray to anybody else, you're going to be thrown into the hungry lion's den. So what did Daniel do? Daniel went and prayed about it. Probably thank God with thanksgiving and uh then and so i'm sure when they're arresting him he was praying i'm sure when they were come on they're running out of time here now dear god and as he got to the lion's den it's getting late finally when he's in the air being thrown into the den that's surely too late it wasn't daniel's three friends in the fire as they heated up the fire and the, and the friends are saying to Nebuchadnezzar, I don't care about your dumb idol. We're not going to bow down to it. Our God's able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your dumb idol. That's in Daniel 3, verses 8 to 19. Daniel 3. Read that sometime if you're not familiar with the story. But even if you are familiar, go back and read what they said, and they did. And when they heated it up, surely this is too late. He's still, but it's not too late yet. 
and they finally threw them into the fire. The guys who threw them in the fire burned themselves. They died from the, from the heat. Nebuchadnezzar looks in. Again, a moment of testimony. Then we throw in three. How come I see four? The fourth one looks like the Son of God. And they're basically saying, come on, Nebi, it's kind of nice in here. <laughs> they came out, not a hair of their, not a single hair was singed. There was no smell of smoke or fire on them. They were intact. They were fine. So don't panic when things in a storm, a hurricane's getting closer and closer. It's too late to move. You, maybe you should have moved out, but you didn't. Or maybe you couldn't have moved out. Others had priority. Illnesses not being healed. It's, now it's too late. No, it isn't. If God wants to heal, he will. I would like us all to read the whole story of Esther again, especially chapters 4, 7, and 8. And understand what happened. Haman was a rising star in the court. He thought so anyway. And Mordecai was a Jew, actually a Benjamite Jew from the tribe of Benjamin originally. And Agag was probably a descendant of, I mean, Haman was probably a descendant of Agag the Amalekite because he's called Haman the Agagite. And he's facing now another Benjamite. The first one that Agag, the king, had met was King Saul, who didn't do his job, and he left some people alive. And now one of their descendants apparently doesn't like this Benjaminite, Mordecai, because he wouldn't grovel in front of him when he'd come around. So therefore, since he didn't like Mordecai, he thought everybody like Mordecai has to go. Some people are doing that today in our country. Since we don't like Trump, then everybody who voted for him conservatives, Republicans, or whatever, or even if you didn't vote, if you're conservative or you're a Christian, you're probably kind of like a, a Trump believer, Trump, uh, not believer, but follower. So they want to re-educate people. They're talking about re-education and deprogramming. I don't know if it's going to come to that or not, but it's kind of what was going on here. So anyway, my point is, he talked the king into having a law passed that on a certain day, all the Jews, there would be genocide. No Jews left alive, man, woman, and child. All of them would be killed. And everything they owned would be given to the people who killed them. Haman was thinking pretty highly of himself. No one knew that Esther was a Jew. Not the king, not Haman. So she invites Haman to a beautiful dining uh, dinner situation with the king and her and Haman. Haman's probably feeling, oh man, I'm... I'm really getting up there, uh, just three of us, what a, what a great time. And, but in the dinner, she says, King, please spare my life. There have been plans made to kill me, and not just me, but all my people. You can read that, I think, in, 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 in Esther 7. But my point is, it ended up with Haman being hanged on, the, on his own seven-story gallows that he had made for Mordecai. He wanted everybody in the kingdom from a long ways off to be able to see Mordecai up there. And this is what happens, anybody who goes against Haman. Well, what happened was that eight, Haman and his ten kids ended up on the gallows. But before all that, Esther had a decision to make. She had to, Esther had to understand that she had a calling, and she didn't even know about that crazy law until Mordecai alerted her of it and uh, told her all about it. That's in Esther 4. And um, she finally had to stand up and do her job. She was the only one who could do it, that God could use. At least it looked that way. But even Mordecai says, Esther, if you don't step up, God will use someone else. And God would have. If the people didn't praise Yeshua as they came in on, and they're putting down the palm leaves and all that, and the Pharisees were criticizing him for letting them praise him, he says, hey, if these people wouldn't praise, then stones would be raised up who would praise. God's not bound to use the people we think we have to, he has to use, nor is he bound by the timing that we all think. So it's all getting pretty late for Esther. But anyway, let's go back to Esther's calling. She had been called out of the masses of people to be the wife, or one of the wives, of this king Ahasuerus. Very beautiful woman. No one thought she was a, a Jew. And she was groomed, bathed, perfumed, and trained. But then when the demonic-inspired genocide came about, now was her time to fulfill her real purpose, not to be just queen, but to be her real purpose, to save her people alive. 
Had Satan been successful, there would have been no Joseph or Mary years later. There would have been no way to have Yeshua be born of Judah. So that's the bigger picture. And that's really what Satan was focusing on. Not just that he didn't like Jews. He didn't like us people, we people, having a savior. So anyway, Mordecai, in the meantime, had saved the king's life. So in Esther 4, Mordecai learns about all this, what had gone on. And um, they're all weeping and crying and wailing and fasting. All the Jews are. The first four, three verses of Esther, we'll put it up there, you can be reading that. Esther hadn't even heard of this. Now she's being told that, let's keep the scriptures up there for a while. Now she's being told that Mordecai's wailing and in sackcloth and all that kind of stuff too. And so finally Mordecai let, alerts her and lets, lets her in on what's happened. And someday it will be very dangerous for us to also be a Christian. And we will have to step up. We'll have to show up, step up, speak up. Yes, I am a Christian. I make no apologies for it. Like the wonderful girl, I think it was in Columbine. This guy was going around with a gun. And if you're a Christian, I'm going to shoot you in the head. I think some did say, no, no, I, I, I'm not a Christian. They came to her. Are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? And she said, yes, I am a Christian. Would you and I have acted that way? She was killed, as I recall. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she was killed. But the story was very inspiring because she didn't fear. And she stood up. Because if we are afraid and to confess Christ, he, he won't confess us either. But my point is, you are Esther. And you say, no, I'm no Esther. And yes, you are. You're not just a person called out from the masses to be the, the queen or the queen of uh, uh, of, of per, uh you know, the, of that empire, the Persian Empire. No, you, you've been called to be the, the wife of the Son of God, the King of Kings. And you will have to stand up. And you will have to say, I'm part of this union. I am a Christian. And I'm not afraid to say that. And he says to her in Esther 4, let's put that up, verse 13 and 14. Don't think in your heart you're going to escape if you don't say or do anything now. Because, hey, God will call, call someone else. But in fact, what he says at the end of verse 14, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this, that bold print lettering that you see up there, let lettering. Your whole purpose was for this time. Our purpose is for this time. God wants to use you to be able to confess Christ. God wants to use you to be able to disciple other people. God wants to use you to buy your life. Your best sermon you can preach is a changing life. I've got to be changed and changing. I've got to be growing in Christ, more of him and less of me. And so do you. We need to be discipling people. That's not just minister's job. That's all of us. And when our time comes to confess him, we better confess him. Luke 12 verse 8 and 9 says, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will confess before the angels of heaven, the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Now, when the early church, with the apostles, when they were being persecuted and attacked, dragged into court, jailed, they were driven away from their homes. You can read it for yourself in Acts 8, verses 1 to 4. And you would... You would think, maybe we would think, if they're that eager to get rid of me because I'm a Christian, I better just shut up for a while. I don't have to say I'm a Christian. But I love that verse in Acts 8, verses 1 to 4, one of those verses, I think it's verse 3 or 4, where it says, and everywhere they went, they went preaching the word. You're not going to shut us up. We're going to tell people about this Yeshua. So what happens later is that many, many more Jews, many, many more Gentiles, because of the seed that they planted, came into the church. When Paul was stoned and left for dead in Lystra, which is the south, south central Turkey today, uh, imagine that. Let's, let's put it up there. Acts, not, Acts 14, verses 19 to 20. Acts 14, 19 to 20. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside of the city, supposing him to be dead. The disciples came, oh no, Paul, look at him. He rose up. Maybe God resurrected him. I don't know. 
He probably had concussions, probably had fractured skull, fractured ribs, maybe a broken hip, all these rocks and stones piling on him, broken nose, broken hand. Who knows? They dragged him out unconscious. Guess what he does? He rose up and went back into the city. That's what went before us. People unafraid. I'm not there yet. I'm praying for it. Would you have gone right back into the town that tried to kill you? Paul did. Anyway, so Esther did, did end up fasting. You know the story, like I told you, in, uh, in, in Nehemiah. I'm, I'm sorry, the book of Esther. And the ones who dug a, a big trap for her and the Jews ended up being the ones who were killed. So we can't predict when God will act, if God will act, or when God will act. But it's okay. He's God, and he's our loving Father, and we love him, and we trust him, and we know him, and he wants to know us, and we want to be pleasing to him. He does have this wonderful verse in Isaiah 60, verse 22, the last part of it. I know the context is about other things, but the, the, the principle applies no matter when. Isaiah 60, verse 22 B, as they call it, the, the last part of it. I am the Lord. When it's time, I will make things happen quickly. I am the Lord. When it's time, I will make things happen quickly. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not. I am with you. Don't be dismayed. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Quit fearing. Look to me and wait for me when I say wait and move when I say move. Because God has us engraved on the palms of his hands. Isaiah 49, verse 16. God has us engraved on the palms of his hand. He sees us there. He knows all about us. You don't have to remain in fear. You can trust him. So I hope that that's been helpful. We Christians now have to live a life that is the calling we've been called to do. Not, not afraid. We need to start looking to God, not human answers, not, not Trump, not Biden, not anybody else in your country. All the crazy stuff happening with voting and machines that are changing votes, adding votes, at least some people say they did. You know, we don't know. We, I, it's what I hear. It's what I hear in other countries. Why do we have these machines? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, my point is... Um, have a love for God that drives us to the one way we have before God, the, the one righteous way of leading other people to Christ, to disciple our friends, love our enemies, trust God, have no fear, look for his timing, trust that he knows what he's doing, have peace, don't let yourself be afraid, don't look to human solutions, look to God. Okay? All these things that I hope all these hard times are teaching us. So thank God for the hard times. Thank God for the shakings. Why? Because that which cannot be shaken will remain. Thank God for the shakings. Okay? Because the, what cannot be shaken, the eternal things, will be what counts. And there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. Paul says that in Romans 8. Anyway, next time we'll talk about the shakings. How bad will they get? Can they get? Uh, do they have to get bad? And I'll tell you what God says directly from his word. So a lot of the answers of what he, do, what he will do will depend on what we do. He says so, and I'll show you that. But if we don't do what he wants us to do, what he prays and hopes we will do and wants us to do, the hammer is coming down and tough, really, really hard times, tougher than the world's ever seen. Anyway, Father, we thank you so much that we can come in hard times and know you're there, that though thousands are falling on our left and our right, you're there. And we, we just aren't going to let fear come into our hearts and minds. We're going to let the peace of Christ come over us and in us. We bless you. We praise you. And Father, I just lift these people up to you, that you will watch them, protect them, send your guardian angels around every one of their homes, put spiritual, a spirit dome around them of protection in the hard times that are coming. And we praise you. We love you. Boy, do we love you. Help us love you more. Help us overcome. Help us return to you. Help us seek you. We praise you and we love you with all of our hearts, Father in heaven. Amen and amen in Jesus' name. 
Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.